All right, so last time we looked at, um, at the end of class, we looked at mean, median, and mode. And remember, we talked about the point of those things is to predict future values. It's not just to um, summarize the data where you want to use it for something. So today we're going to get a little bit more in depth with that, um, figuring out what we can expect values to be. Um, so I want to revisit average and maybe use some different notation because we're going to use some similar notation for the expected value formula. Um, so let's say that I wanted you to find the average or the mean of the numbers um, x1, x2, x3, and so on. Okay. Um, so the average, of course, formula that we talked about last class involves you adding all those values together. And of course I'm saying dot, dot, dot because I'm not telling you how many values there are. So you add up all the values, whatever they happen to be. Oh, well, my whiteout pen is deciding it's not going to work. There it goes. Um, and then you divide however by however many values you have. Okay. Um, but this only works when the values are equally likely. or equally weighted. So for instance, if you wanted to find out your homework average in my class, you could do a straight up average, right? You could add up all the grades on all your homework assignments and you could divide by however many there were and that would be your homework, um, that would be your homework average. But you wouldn't be able to do that with every grade in my class, right? Since tests are worth more than homework and quizzes are worth different from that and projects are worth um, a different percentage um, also. So basically, how do we handle situations which are pretty common, honestly, where values are not equally likely or weighted? And so that is what expected value is going to do for us. So expected value, um, a lot of people call this a weighted average. Um, or, but like the name implies, it's basically what you can expect a random value to be. Um, given the probabilities of each of the values. So um, we are going to refer to expected value most of the time in this book as E of X, E for expected value. So it's what we expect X to be. So before I give you um, the formula, let me tell you when you'll use this as opposed to straight up regular old mean. You use expected value when um, the outcomes are not equally likely or they're not weighted the same. Because frankly, if they are all equally likely slash equally weighted, then you just need to use straight up average. So we only need something different when the values are not worth the same quantities. <clears throat> so I'm about to give you the formula. Um, we are going to use um, this X sub number notation, like X sub one, X sub two. Um, X, sub ten, X sub N um, are the values. So X sub 1 would be value 1. 
x sub 2 would be value 2, x sub 3 would be value 3, and so on and so forth. Um, we're also going to have a p value. p stands for probability. And so p sub n is basically um, the probability of each x sub n. So if I refer to p sub 1, it means the probability that the x sub 1 occurred. p sub 2 is the probability that x sub 2 occurred. So it's like um, the x the x's are the values and the p's are the probabilities of each individual value. Okay, And so then if we use that notation, the formula for expected value is x sub 1 times its probability plus x sub 2 times its probability plus x sub 3 times its probability. I think you kind of see the point. Um, and then we'll keep going until we get to the very last one, which would be x sub n times its probability. Okay, so if there are 10 values, you'll do this 10 times. Um, notice we don't have to divide by anything. Okay, this is just good formula. Um, okay, so let's look at an example where we might use this. So let's say that a salesman has kind of tracked his sales in the past, and he figures that he has the following daily commissions Um, with the given probabilities. So if you work on commission, you don't make the same amount each day, right? You make an amount determined by how much you sold. <clears throat> so let's just kind of keep it um, simple. So let's say that here are the following commission amounts that he has made in the past. And then we're going to list the probability or how frequently he gets that commission. So let's say that he gets anywhere from 100 to a bad sales day of $0. Okay. And then let's say that these are the probabilities. Mm hmm And let's say that I want you to find um, his expected daily commission. Okay, so first thing, um, you could check it on your calculator, but note um, all of these add up to what? Or what should they add up to? Yeah. They all add up to one, which stands for what percentage? 100%. <clears throat> so it wouldn't be correct for us to just do a straight up average of all of these things. Why? Because they're not weighted the same, right? What is he most likely to make on any given day? $75 is his biggest one. Um, fortunately for him, what's his least likely commission amount? Zero dollars, right? Good for him, right? Because that's probably not a good day. Um, so let's see if we can figure out what the expected amount would be. So it is literally just pair them up, multiply them, and add them. So the first value, and it doesn't really matter what order you go in as long as you pair them up with the right thing. So he can make $100 28% of the time. He makes $75 32% of the time. And then so on and so forth. Notice I'm just kind of going through the list and pairing the right things together. <clears throat> okay, so before we punch this in the calculator, notice he better get a commission amount somewhere between zero and 100, right? It wouldn't make sense to average a bunch of numbers between zero and 100 and get something other than, you know, um, like outside of that range. Um, so you'll just take your calculator and you don't really even need parentheses because your calculator knows to do multiplication first. So you can do parentheses if you like. I really just wrote them because it's nicer to kind of keep them separate that way. 
Notice I'm going to do the zero one. Let me move that over. But zero times anything would just be what? Zero. So that's not really um, anything. But I get 6650. So um, over the long haul, he can figure that he'll average 6650. Okay. Now notice, on any given day, he's not going to make exactly 6650, right? Some days he's going to make more than that. Some days he's going to make less than that. In fact, the only values he can literally make on a given day are these five, right? But over the long haul, if he wanted to figure out maybe how much he would make per month, he could take this average amount and multiply that by however many days of the month, okay? or however many days he's working, I guess. <clears throat> Okay, um, so I don't know if we've ever really talked about this before, so if this is a review, I apologize, but I think we haven't defined this. Um, a probability distribution is just um, where you list out the probabilities of each of the values. So it's a list of the probabilities of all possible outcomes. Um, and, of course, the probabilities must add up to 1. If you're listing all the outcomes, then the probabilities need to show that. So that commission table that I just gave you is technically a probability distribution because it listed all the possible commissions he could have gotten um, plus the probabilities that he got that commission on any given day. All right, so one way that you can show the probabilities is in a table format like I just showed you there. Okay? Um, another way that you can show them is um, through the use of what's called a histogram. So I feel like you probably have seen a histogram before um, when you're talking about data in other classes. Um, but it's sort of a bar graph. So I'm just going to say it's like a bar graph. It's technically like a special kind of bar graph. Um, that can show probabilities. Histograms don't always show probabilities, but for our purposes, we're going to draw one that does. Um, histograms are usually for number type data. Um, all right, so let's come up with um, an example of what that might look like. So we're going to find the probability of different number of pets in a particular household. So let's see if we can kind of recreate this histogram. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to list the probabilities this way. And let's just count by fives. So this will be 5% written as a decimal. This will be 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. <clears throat> Make my line a little straighter there. Okay, um, and then we're going to have anywhere from zero to three or more pets. And so I'm going to use a different color, um, but histograms are usually um, going to kind of look like this. They usually don't have any spaces between the bars, so let's make this one. Um, about 0.2 tall. Um, let's make the one about 0.3 tall. And then let's make the last two about 0.25 tall. So it doesn't need to really be completely perfect, but um, notice that I'm trying to kind of center the bars. Normally histograms will look this way. So 
<clears throat> bar graphs typically will have space in between the bars. Um, histograms typically do not. And histograms typically um, are tracking some sort of numeric data. Okay, so um, a bar graph might show like the pet names down here typically, um, but a histogram usually shows number data. So notice from this histogram, you can actually read all the probabilities, right? So the probability of zero pets um, was what? 0 0.20, right? Um, the probability of one pet looks like about 0.30. And then the probability of, oh, let's make this three or more. Um, the probability of two pets would be um, 0 0.25. And the probability of three or more also equals 0 0.25. So if I asked you if this was a probability distribution, you would have to make sure that the probability seemed reasonable. Okay? In other words, each probability needs to be something between 0 and 1. Um, and then the probabilities need to add up to 1. Okay? Um, so note, all the probabilities add up to 1. Okay. Um, so this is one form of a probability distribution. So this is usually for scenarios where like someone has already collected the data and it's just going to show it to you in some sort of graph format. <clears throat> And so a histogram can have many patterns. Um, but a common pattern that we're actually going to discuss a little bit more next class, a pattern, a common pattern is um, called bell shape. And this is what a bell-shaped pattern looks like. A bell-shaped pattern peaks in the center. We're going to write out the description of it in a minute. So I'm going to draw the middle bar first. And then it kind of tapers off. The further you get away from um, the middle, the more it kind of levels off or gets lower and lower. <clears throat> so note... Um, bell-shaped curves peak in the center. And basically goes down from there in both directions. about what kinds of data might give us this bell-shaped curve because it's actually got a special name um, and some special qualities. Okay, but for now, just know that histograms um, don't have to look like this, but when they do, they're called bell-shaped. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at a couple of scenarios where expected value might be warranted, and then we're going to see if we can organize our data in a probability distribution. So let's say that you are either selling or playing some sort of raffle game where you buy tickets for a dollar. Um, all right, so here are the prizes you could win from this raffle. There will be one $500 prize. There will be three 
$100 prizes. Five twenty dollar prizes, and finally twenty five dollar prizes. So, what is your expected value? Um, of your winnings if you buy a one dollar ticket. So we're not just going to jump straight into the expected value formula. We're going to come up with a probability distribution, which is just a really good way to organize our data. We could do that as a histogram if we wanted to, but I think we'll just do it in chart form. Okay, because there's only a few possibilities for what we will win, right? Um, you just need to think about it for a little bit, right? The actual highest winning is not $500. It's close. Okay, but how much would you actually win if you won the $500 prize? You actually only win how much? $4.99. Why do I say that? Because you had to pay the dollar for the ticket, right? So I'm going to do this. You can do this on your um, notebook paper. So the next possibility is you might win $99. $19. That's the $20 prize minus the dollar, right? $4.00. But it's not mentioned because they want you to play the game, right? But what are you most likely actually to win? Not just nothing, but you're actually likely to win what? Negative one dollar, meaning what? You lose a dollar, right? Okay. So let's talk about the probabilities for these things, right? How many tickets did we sell? Five thousand, right? So what's your chance of winning the big prize, the four ninety nine? One in 5,000, right? So we can use a fraction here. We could change it to a decimal if we want to, but I think leaving it as a fraction is fine. Okay. What about what's your chances of winning the next prize, the $100 one, which technically only gets you $99 in profit? Three out of 5,000. Um, what about um, the $20 prize? How many of those are there? Five. Mm-hmm, five out of 5,000. This one is 20 out of 5,000. So how are we going to figure out what goes here? Yeah, so we probably need to figure out how many winners we have. Okay, because then we need to know how many losers we have, right? So the number of winners is 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 20, right? So we have 29 winners, which means we have how many that didn't win? Whatever 5,000 minus that is, right? So 5,000 minus 29 is 4,971 out of 5,000. Okay, so by far, you have the most chance of doing what in this game? Losing your dollar, right? By far. Okay, it's definitely the most likely. Um, so let's talk about what your expected winnings are. So we're going to use our formula. So you could win $499 with a probability of 1 out of 5,000. <coughs> Um, but you also could win $99 with a probability of 3 out of 5,000. So notice we're doing the same thing that we did in the last full example. We're just using fractions here instead of decimals. So in this case, I probably would, if I were you, use parentheses around the fractions when you plug it in the calculator. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what the amount for this is. Um, it works out to be about negative 80 cents. Okay, it should make sense to you that it's a negative amount. Why? What are most people going to do? Lose. Most people are going to lose, so it is a negative amount, right? So what that means is on average, if you average out every single person that played the game, 
every person is losing 80 cents. Okay? But notice, it's actually probably more likely that they're, they're not losing 80 cents. No one's losing literally 80 cents, right? That's an average. Okay? What are most people going to lose? A dollar, right? So if I randomly just point at someone, then their expected winnings are probably going to be negative one dollar. Um, so notice in this case, the mode would actually be more helpful than the weighted mean, because what would the mode be? Like, what are most people going to do? Get the negative one, right? They're going to lose the dollar. Um, so if you were actually really, truly trying to predict future data, in this case, um, the average slash weighted average is really not the better tool. The better tool would just be go for the mode, right? Most people are going to lose the buck and um, probably not be too, too sad about it. Um, all right, so let's look at another scenario. So let's say that the annual premium for a $5,000 theft policy on a piece of art cost $150. Um, insurance companies will insure anything, okay? So, um, but they also will come up with the probability that they will have to pay out on this claim. So let's say they determine the probability that a painting is stolen from wherever it is being housed um, is 0.01. So what is your expected value if you buy a policy? So notice I'm taking it from the perspective of the customer, not the business owner, not the insurance company, in other words. So make sure you're thinking about that from the perspective of the customer. So the vast majority of the time, you're going to lose $150. If you're the customer, how come? You're going to pay for the policy, right, to cover your rear end, right? But there's a what kind of percentage chance that you won't even really need the policy? What's the chance that it's stolen? 1%. So what's the chance that you're fine and you didn't even need the policy really? 99%. Okay. Um, but if you do need the policy, right, you get $5,000. But remember, you had to pay $150 for that, right? So what's the net that you actually get back in your pocket? It's actually $5,000 take away the $150, right? So $4,850. And that is going to come to you 0.1% of the time. So the expected value of um, this policy for you is 99% of the time you'll lose the 150. But of course, you're not buying it for that reason. You're buying it for the 1% chance that the artwork is stolen. And so if you plug this in, you're going to get negative $100. So essentially what that means is that the insurance company is making $100 off of every client, right? So they don't necessarily care about the 1% that they have to pay out the claim to. What they care about is the 99 people, or 99 out of 100 people rather, um, that they're getting the $150 for. So this is a very simplified way that really all insurance works. Car insurance works this way too, right? Um, you pay for car insurance because you have to, right? But what do you kind of hope, of course? You hope that you don't really ever use it, right? So every age group, if you wonder, why is my insurance policy uh, more money than my parents' insurance policy, that's because you are considered to have more of a probability that you will have an accident. So they figure out, there's actually high-paid people that figure out the probabilities of every gender, every age group, even areas of the country, um, of how likely you are in your demographic to have an accident, and then they decide what your policy is amount, amount is based on that. Okay? But rest assured, they're going to make the money, right? So that's why, of course, you as the customer are losing the $100, okay? <clears throat> okay, 
So when you have values that are not equally likely, it can be helpful to come up with charts like this. And what do we call charts like this? Or histograms if we want to draw the visual data. Probability distributions, right? So it lists all the choices and then the probabilities that each of those choices would occur. Okay. Um, so the last thing that we're going to cover today is something called standard deviation. This formula is going to require um, your calculator for sure, okay? But the standard deviation is something we're going to look at next class also, but it's a measure of distance away from the mean. discusses how far out from the mean we actually are. Um, and so we're going to have some notation here. So um, this symbol right here is a capital sigma in Greek letters. But in math, it means the sum. It means add up all of these numbers. So for our purposes, um, we're going to use lowercase s that stands for standard deviation. And it is going to be um, the square root of the sum of all the x minus x with a bar over them. I'm going to tell you what all these values are over n minus 1. Okay, so if you're wondering, you will not need to memorize this formula. You will just need to know what each of these variables stand for. Okay, um, so x is each individual value. Um, X bar is the average or the mean of the X's. And N is the um, number of values we have. So you are going to want to um, organize this in um, a certain way. Okay, um, so we're going to start a problem and we might finish it next time. But we're going to find the standard deviation. Of the following list of numbers. Um, wanted to find the standard deviation or it's a description of how far away these numbers would be from the mean. So before we can come up with a formula for this, we need to find the average of the x's. Okay, remember we're calling this x with a bar over it. So notice that we have 10 values and um, they're all equally likely even though we repeat a few um, because we can just take the sum divided by 10. So 46 divided by 10 is 4.6. So I'm going to circle this. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a table. And I'm going to start this table off for you. And then I'm going to ask you to kind of come to class next time with it completed. So first, we're going to list all the values that we have. And notice I am listing duplicates, and I'm not changing the order of them. I'm just listing all 10 values, like so. So first, what we're going to do is find the value minus the average, but we already know the average, right? So for this one, we would do 4 minus 4.6, so we would get negative 0 0.6. 5 minus 4.6 would be 0 0.4, okay? So I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to let you punch them in, okay, into your calculator. 
And then I'm, I'm trying to get basically the sum of all of these. So then we're going to take whichever values we have here squared. And the reason we're doing that again is because that's what the formula up here says, right? We want the difference squared. <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of write that here. Um, so I'm going to tell you what these are, right? If you square 0 0.6 or negative 0 0.6, you get 0.36. Here you're going to get 0.16. But I want you to finish this table out. And then I want you to sum them all up here. Okay, so this is going to be a really important quantity. Okay, we want to know what the sum is there. Okay, and then I want you to see if off to the side you can figure out what the S is. Because remember, the S is the square root of all the X minus X bars squared divided by N minus 1. So whatever you get here is going to go in for the numerator. And then we'll divide it by what? What is n in this case? How many numbers do we have? 10, so what would n minus 1 be? 9, right? So you're basically going to get the square root of something over 9. Okay. So whatever you get for the sum is going to go right here. And then we're going to figure out what the standard deviation is. <clears throat> okay. So um, because we're out of time, um, I want you to see if you can finish that before next time. Okay, so we'll start class next time seeing if you got that correct quantity. Okay. Um, so notice, all I want you to do here is find the difference. All I want you to do here is do what with that difference? Square it. And then once you're done with all 10 entries, you do what with them? Add them up. And then you'll put that into your formula. Okay. So I want you to come to class next time, hopefully with like a number for me. There should be a number right here. And this is going to represent whatever you get here is going to represent your distance from the mean. <clears throat> okay, so see if you can fix that for now.